Uh, let's give them a hand. I thought they did a good job leading us today. And you did a great job. And you sounded like you wanted to get on a tour bus and start going around and singing places. Uh, but uh, it is really good to see you online and in the room here with us today. So let me just give you a little test. How many would rather be here than out in the rain? Raise your hand. All right, good. Man, you are glad to be here. Uh, how many would rather be here than in jail? Let's hear it. Uh, yeah? How many of you came from jail just to be here today? All right, I see some hands there. I got to tell you this story. This is an absolutely true story. Uh, not that I tell lies normally, but nevertheless, this is an absolutely true story. Uh, Kim and I, many years ago, we had a dear friend. His name was Dr. Richard White, and he was a pastor of a Baptist church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but it's very Cajun, and uh, you can get some crawfish pie. I don't know if you like crawfish or not, but they're very, very good. You get a lot of Cajun cooking there, but he had this church, and uh, they had many different ministries, and one of their ministries was a prison ministry. Now, if you've ever been to a Baptist church, you know that Traditionally, traditional Baptist churches, they sing hymns, and normally there are several verses to a hymn. And I don't know why this happened or why this started, but normally they'll skip a, you know, if it has four verses, they'll skip a verse, all right? Uh, and then often they will uh, mix it up by saying, all right, on the second verse, all the ladies sing. Or on the third verse, all the men sing. So they would get it mixed up, and, and Dr. White um, he was going to preach at their prison ministry. And uh, we, he would get there, and all of the prisoners that chose, they didn't force them, but the, all the prisoners that chose, they would come in there, and they would, he would lead a worship service. And they were leading a song, and I guess they got so used to their Baptist traditions, uh, they were like, uh, on the second verse, all the drug dealers sing, all right. And he swears that this is a true story, so... But it doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is. You are welcome here. We're so glad that you are here. We love to say that Stillwaters is the perfect place for imperfect people. So if you're not perfect, uh, you've found a good home. And we're just so glad uh, that you're here. Well, today, I'm going to read to you a story from the book of Acts. And this is about the apostle Paul. And it was a very important point in his ministry. And what he had been doing is he had been traveling all over that part of the world and he was ministering in churches. But one of the things he was doing was collecting an offering. He said, that sounds just like a preacher going in and collecting money. No, what he was doing, he didn't have like the Apostle Paul Evangelistic Association that he was trying to get people to support, but rather they were collecting money for Christians in Jerusalem that were being persecuted there in the church. What had happened was that many uh, Christians of the church there in Jerusalem, they, they lost their livelihoods, they lost their families often, uh, they were being persecuted and they were struggling financially to say the least. And so what Paul was doing is he was going to all these churches and he was preaching and ministering and starting churches and what he was say, saying to them was, listen, we want to support these brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Now, in the place that he was at today, what we're going to see was that he was in or at the church in Ephesus. In fact, he didn't actually go back to that church. He called the leadership from the church to come and meet him. Now, he had spent about three years building the church and the leaders in Ephesus and so we're picking up on this story because he outlines some very important things in this story. You're going to pick it up. He talks about generosity. And that's a very odd thing to talk about in a farewell address. That's what he was doing. He invited these, uh, all these leaders from the church, and he was challenging them. He was encouraging them. But one of the things he was really doing was encouraging them to be generous, to be generous. Now, Paul outlines here not just financially how he was generous, but he was generous with his time and with his talent 
and with his treasure. You've heard that before. If you've been in church very long, you've heard preachers say that. We give to God our time. And Paul talks about this, how he was generous with his time, how he was very intentional with his time. And that's a lesson for us. We too must put God first in our time. And I believe this is all my heart. In your life, success begins on Sunday. In other words, you put God first in the first day of the week and go to church. You worship him. That's very, very important. And I've said this because I got this from the Bible, actually, not something I came up with, that when it comes to being successful, you can get more done in six days than you can in seven. You say, how does that work? It's the principle of first. When you give to God the first part of your time or your talent or your treasure, your money, God always multiplies. God always blesses. And so this is what he's talking about. It's not just about money, but rather he was talking about that we must be very serious in how we look at life, how we allot our time, how we use our talent. Did you know that God has talented you the way that you are for reason? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get better at something or discover a new skill Uh, I encourage that. I encourage education. I encourage hard work and trying to get better. But what he wants us to do is not so much focus on our talent for us. Certainly nothing wrong with getting better at what you do. Having a good business plan of expanding your business, of trying to get a raise at work. These are all wonderful things, okay? But he says, I want you to understand why. God has given you this talent. Why God has given you the time that he's given you. Why God has given you the treasure he's given you. So, um, he ends this farewell address with the famous words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, this principle is incredibly important in our lives. And what you're going to learn from this is that it's not just in giving money, but rather when I give of my time, I'm giving of myself. When I give of my time, it's more blessed to give that time than receiving. He's not talking about receiving more time at the end of your life, but he's talking about how others invest in you, relationships in your life, that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is just a fundamental principle of life. And we know this is true because as parents, you know how that is. It is more blessed to give. The truth of the matter is when you give to your children, it's an investment in them, but it's also a blessing to you. How many of you remember uh, little toddlers? Your kids were young and, or, or when they were starting to walk or when you were potty training them. Now, now think about this. If you don't believe this principle is true, think about the stupidity, okay, of one human being praising another human being for pooping in a toilet, all right? That is the most common sense, natural thing you should do. You don't have to learn how to poop, okay? But when a parent sees a little toddler, they act like that is Einstein, just discovered the theory of relativity, Why? Because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, okay? And the same same is true, using our uh, children as an example. How many of you, when your children were little, they drew a picture or created something? You know what I did? Uh, One of the things that I did that my parents actually kept, and this was really silly. Uh, When I was about four or five years old, uh, they allowed us at school to make something for our parents and they would let us, use, we had this clay, modeling clay that you can make something of. And what I made for my parents was an ashtray. He said, well, what's funny about that? They didn't smoke, all right? So I made something completely useless, but my mother acted as if that was the greatest gift that she'd ever received. Why? It's more blessed to give than receive. True with your time, true with your talent, true with your treasure. So anyway, let's begin reading uh, this story. 
Acts 20, verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus. This was Apostle Paul. These were the cities that he was talking about. And he called the elders of the church to come to him. Once again, he didn't go there because of the emotions that you're going to see involved in this in a minute. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. He invested his time. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. He was giving his talent, his time, his talent. Testifying to both Jews and the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Now, let me just pause and say this. When you begin to live your life this way, there is going to be adventure and excitement that you cannot experience. There's going to be purpose that you cannot experience in living a self-centered, selfish life. You say, wait a minute, sounds like he's putting himself in danger. Well, the reason he said this, and he felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking to him, and I'm not saying the Holy Spirit didn't speak to him, but it was a very common sense thing that if he went back to Jerusalem, that they were going to imprison him. You know why? Because they said they were going to if he ever came back. They said they were going to kill him if he ever came back. And he's wanting to go back Well, of course he's stepping into danger. But what does this illustrate? Well, let's read the next verse. He said, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, he's saying, I'd rather die than not live this adventure. Now, let me ask you a question. You ever been there as a Christian? A lot of times we get so complacent, don't we? We get so discouraged so easily. And yet Paul got this idea that it's more blessed to give than to receive. He discovered a life that he was willing to die for. He discovered a purpose that he was so passionate about that he said, I don't count my life as worth anything anything compared to this purpose. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that before, where you are so committed to the purpose, to the cause, to Jesus Christ, that everything else pales in comparison. You say, I've got to do this thing. Now, I believe that God gives us these purposes and a single purpose, if you will, in pleasing him. And Paul found it. And he said, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the gospel will see my face again. He he was willing even to sacrifice relationships. Now, he's not saying that as a family, you should work so hard that you neglect your children. That's not what he's suggesting. That is not God's will for your life. What he's saying is that he was willing personally because of the ministry to go where God called him. And I know what that's like. Um, I grew up in North Carolina. Uh, My mom and dad grew up there. All of our family for generations lived there. And yet when I was 16 years old, I knew that God called me to the ministry and I was willing to go. And I went to Florida and then to Georgia And since I was 17 years old, I've never lived where my family lives, okay? So I know what that's like, that call to say, you know what, we're going to go. My mom and dad, the same thing. They lived in North Carolina all their life. And then one day God called my parents to be missionaries and they left. And then they pastored a church in Arizona and then they came back. And, and, And my point is this, you've got to be willing to understand that this life This passion, this blessing comes when we give our time, our talent, 
and our treasure. And, and the question then becomes, are you doing that? Well, let's read on. He said, therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all. In other words, he had fulfilled his duty, his responsibility to them. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. And he's talking to the pastors, leaders in the church. He said, watch over the church. He, he said, uh, the reason, uh, he says, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And if among, among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build, up, build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one silver or gold or apparel. You know yourselves that these hands ministered to my necessities. In other words, he worked for it. And to those who were with me. So in other words, not only did he work, but he helped others. So here's the treasure, the, the, the money part. So he's talking about his time. He's talked about his talent, what God had given him, these opportunities. And he talked about the passion that comes with that. Now he talks about the money part. He said, in all these things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. So I, I read all this story to give you context to what Paul quoted here that we so famously use all the time. It's more blessed to give than to receive. What does that mean? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, I've already given you a couple of examples and we can go through many, many others. But I just want to ask a couple of fundamental questions according to this passage that will help us. Just two important questions. How does generosity make you more blessed and how can you develop that? I mean, if it's something that makes you more blessed, wouldn't you like to know how to do it better? How to get better at it? So question number one. How are you more blessed by giving than receiving? Well, there are three ways that I see in this text that we read. And the first is spiritually. When you give, we're talking about time, talent, and treasure. Uh, your time, uh, your efforts, your service, your money. Giving financially, putting God first, following biblical principles, okay? Okay. And by the way, there's more to biblical principles of money management than just simply giving to the church. If all you ever hear is a preacher standing up harping about giving and you miss the blessing of it, then you're missing the point, okay? Or maybe the pastor's missing the, giving you the point. And, and, and the point is this, there are incredible blessings associated with giving, giving of your time, your your talent, your abilities, your, your efforts, your service, and your money. How? Spiritually. In this text, we saw several ways that he was blessed spiritually. He talked about them. Spreading the gospel. When you give, uh, you are helping spread the good news of Jesus Christ. He talked about their faith was increased because they gave. And the Bible says this is how you please God. You can only please God through faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. It increases your faith. It gives you a deeper understanding of God's grace. He talked about God's grace overwhelming them and being poured out on them. And the more you understand God's grace, remember, it's his unmerited kindness and favor. He gives to us what we don't deserve. We don't earn it. God's mercy is he does not give to us what we do deserve. In other words, we may deserve judgment, but God withholds that because of his grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. And the more you understand this and the deeper understanding you have of God's grace, it changes your life. I can honestly say, when I first began in ministry and graduated from Bible college and starting in my first ministry and the second ministry, and even this, it started really changing for me in that second ministry that I worked at. 
When I first started, though, I didn't really have a deep understanding of God's grace. I was, listen, I was driven by guilt. I was driven by works. Not that we shouldn't do good works. But that's what I thought God expected. Last year, you worked 48 hours a week. This year, you got to work 50 hours a week. Uh, Last year, you worked 50. This year, you got to work 52. And and there was just this, and and I realized this after I'd heard all these preachers. I went to this Bible conference, and I heard all these preachers preach about what you should do. And uh, one preacher talked about how much time a day you should spend in prayer. Another preacher talked about how much time a day you should spend in reading the Bible. Another preacher talked about how much time you should worship God. Another one talked about how much time you should go to church. Another one talked about how much time you should spend working around the church and serving and all this kind of stuff. And you know what the funny thing is? They had literally put a time on it, okay? And I added it up, and it was 28 hours a day that I was supposed to do this stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute. Something's not right here. But you know what I had? I had an incomplete understanding of the grace of God, and therefore I was guilt driven. I didn't do anything because I love the Lord. Oh, I love the Lord, but I loved him because I thought if I didn't, he was going to smite me. Anybody ever been there? That is what we call legalism or Phariseeism. Um, and, and the fact is, that is a miserable existence. Can I just tell you, Christians are supposed to be full of joy, but if you live that way without understanding the grace of God, you're not full of joy, you're full of guilt. But here's what he said. As I got older, by the way, and I began to understand the grace of God, and I began to live by the grace of God, there was such a transformation in my attitude, in my joy. And man, I'm able to handle life a lot better now. You know why? Because back in those days, I didn't understand God's grace. I thought that if I invested some time and some money and some talent, that God owed me big time. And then when anything would happen in my life that didn't go like it was, I'm like, wait a minute, God. Here I am serving you and doing all this and sacrificing for you. Can you imagine anybody telling Jesus how much you sacrifice for him? I, I wonder if he's like fighting back all a sarcastic answer. Oh, really? You ever heard of me dying on the cross? But that is a miserable kind of Christianity. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that have it. But you want to learn, this is what Paul said to these people. Hey, you'll begin to have a deeper understanding for God's grace, and it's going to transform you. In fact, it transformed many of these people so much that they were willing to die. That's how passionate they were. It gave them a renewed passion for what is most important. When you get this, you understand what's most important. Look, sometimes we can't control our schedule. I get that. Sometimes our schedule controls us. But there are things we can control. And and we can make a decision about what is most important in life. He said they'll discover meaning and purpose in life. They'll have deeper community One of the things that humans, since our creation, have desired. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. And we live in a time that claims that we're very social, that we're very connected, but I think we are more disconnected than we've ever been. Social media says that we're social, but the fact is nobody ever talks to each other except through a screen. That's not very social. And we talked about being connected, but being connected digitally is not the same as having FaceTime with another human being. And I'm not here to comment on social media, but here's what I'm saying. They experience deeper community. By the way, that's one of the things that happens when you come to church. There is a community. There is a social uh, connection. There is a gathering. There is a joy. Now I realize you can go sometimes to church and feel like 
you know, somebody was mean or, as you know, I, I remember churches I used to go to work at, um, whenever you preached, I would have certain people come to me and say, step on my toes, man. Or they'd say, that was good, man. I felt like you were punching me in the gut. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't want you to feel like I'm punching you in the gut. I want to focus you on the joy of Christianity. I want to focus you on the joy of Jesus. And when you do that, you're going to have community. And then there was a spiritual protection and covering that he talked about. And we all want that and need that. There's a second uh, blessing that you get when, you're, when you give more blessed by giving than receiving it, and it's materially. Now, I am not a uh, prosperity gospel preacher by any stretch of the imagination, but I challenge you, show me in the Bible where when you give financially that God doesn't bless. He tells us to see him as provider. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things that you need are going to be added to you. He said, when you give, it's going to be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over and needing some room for more. Uh, He said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Look, the fact is you cannot read scripture without the understanding that when you give, God blesses. And, and it's often in a, a way that you didn't expect. Now, once again, don't hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not suggesting that when you give, that you know, you're going to go home and suddenly there's a brand new car in your, in your driveway. Uh, I've heard some people like, you know, man, I gave and I didn't get the raise that I was expecting at work. Well, that's the wrong purpose, okay? Now, can God do that? Of course he can He can do whatever he wants. But here's what I know. He will bless you when you give materially. And I'm not just talking about financially or or in things, but also with talent and time. Have you ever wondered why some people, it seems like that everything they touch, it just seems to turn out right. They make the right choices, the right decision about things. You ever notice how some people are able to connect with people? You say, what is that? Well, I I know that some things are are from our personality, but I do believe that it's because God provides. Those of you that live by sales, there are certain things when you give that it can only be explained that God provided a connection or someone that you'd never met before. God is the one that does that. He provides and he prospers. Now, don't misunderstand the the word prosperity. I know some preachers are afraid of that word, but it's a biblical word. And the Bible talks about, particularly in the Old Testament, that when you meditate on the word of God, you follow him. He says, in everything you do, you're going to prosper. Now, does that mean that uh, when you give of your time, your talent, your treasure, that you're going to go out and every time you play the lottery, you're going to win? That is not what that means. Does that mean that uh, you're going to live, uh, you know, a magical fairy dust, unicorn life that you never have a problem? Well, I got bad news for you. If you think that's what Christianity is, surprise, surprise, because it's not that way. You, you know what it's called? It's called life. Some things, things happen, sometimes things happen in life because of life. That it's not that God is mad at you. I've heard some people that were so uh, everything, you know, uh, about this that I heard one guy, he ran out of gas and he, and he blamed it on God. I'm like, no, you didn't. That wasn't God's fault. You just didn't put any gas in the car. And if you keep on running without putting gas, guess what's going to happen? Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, it's going to run out of gas. And I've heard people talk about, oh, man, you know, I had to replace my tires. I don't feel like God's blessing me. I'm like, really? Well, you expect him to say magical tire dust uh, fall down on you and you'll never have to buy another set of tires. Well, that's not realistic, okay? But what is true is that God will bless you. God will bless you. And he blesses us in many ways. Uh, Luke 12, 31, seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. Everything. 
And then the third way uh, you are more blessed is emotionally. He talks about the cure for greed and covetousness. The cure for it. He was talking about how he worked and how he gave. By the way, I'm going to say this. We often don't take seriously how bad for us covetousness is. Now, um, in the Old Testament, and I realize we live by grace, not by law, but, you know, we don't live by the Ten Commandments, but nobody tells us that it's good to break the Ten Commandments. The, the Ten Commandments are basically, you know, a summation of how we're to treat other people and how we're to behave toward God. God wants us to worship Him. He doesn't want us to put idols uh, in front of Him. Uh, he wants us to honor our parents. He doesn't want us to steal. He doesn't want us to bear false witness, to tell lies in court, or to lie, period. He doesn't want us to commit adultery. Um, he doesn't want us to take his name in vain. And I've always puzzled why among the 10 most important things, I mean, you would think that the 10 commandments, the covenant, that would be the most important things, right? And I've often thought, why did he put the seemingly innocuous sin of covetousness? But did you know that when you covet, you're going to break every other commandment. Why do people steal? Because they covet. Why do people commit adultery? Because they covet. Why do people lie? It's for an advantage to themselves because they covet. Why do people take God's name in vain? Often it's because of covetousness. Oh, I thought God was going to do this, and we curse God for what he didn't do, and we don't bless him for what he did. Covetousness. And you know what Paul was saying here? That the cure for greed and to break the spirit of covetousness is simply being more willing to give than to receive. And when I do that, it changes. It gives me joy because I'm making a difference. It gives me an incredible sense of God's presence and blessings. And then what else happens? He talks about the blessings they got from helping the poor. Uh, in Proverbs, it says this, that you know when you give to the poor, God notices. God pays attention. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd like for God to give me his attention. Not like, hey, I'm going to bat you on top of the head because you disobeyed. That's not what it's talking about. But God notices and is happy and says, I'm going to do something for that person. Why? He's given to the poor. He's broke that spirit of covetousness. He's got joy now. He's thankful. And it transforms the way we think. Well, I don't have time to finish this today, but I will give you the second question. How do you develop a, a generous heart? We've learned how it's more blessed to give than receive. Number one, you got to start it. Ecclesiastes 11.4, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. So start. The second thing is you got to plan it. Proverbs 21.5, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. And then the words of the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. What kind of crop do you want? You want a meager crop or do you want one overflowing? What kind of blessing do you want? Do you want a meager blessing? Now, let's be honest. We're all blessed, right? You woke up today. That's a blessing. God's given you the air in your lungs. That's a blessing. And, and, and so God's given you food to eat, a place to stay. You're not in the rain right now. So, so we have blessing. But you've got to decide in your heart. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need and then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So you start it, you plan it, you got to do it, and then you test it. 
You know, this is one of the few places in the Bible, maybe the only place as far as I know, where God, when he tells us to do something, he says, test me. Come on. Try me. You know, it's like, it's almost like the, the playground bully, you know. It's like, you know, come on. Come on. You, you know, try me out. But the difference is God is challenging you not to beat you up. He's challenging you to bless you. Listen to what he says. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. Interesting. Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Man, what a promise. What a blessing. And so what's the conclusion as we wrap up this entire series on the habits that make you? What's the conclusion? Generous people are happy people. Generous people are happy people. They're happier than people who are not generous. And you can develop that spiritual habit. And so today, I hope you will receive the word of the Lord and receive the challenge that God gives to us to be generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Heavenly Father, help us today. Thank you for the word of God, how it feeds us, how it grows us, and how that we can trust it. And Lord, I pray for those watching online today or those in the room that if they need Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the day that they receive him. And if they're willing to say yes to you, God, I know you will hear and answer their prayers. God bless everyone here and everyone watching, everyone that will watch. Uh, help us to get warm hearts toward you and to realize that it is truly more blessed to give than it is to receive. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.